We can basically, we can basically work. <laughs> we can basically work, yes. We can actually compute an offsetting. <laughs> So, so this is this is actually this looks innocuous, but you will see the consequences of this very soon. And uh, let's actually uh, let's actually mention something that is relevant because you know we all know Gilbert Bomslag. So in general, this is not true. The famous Bomslag Solitar group that uh, Mr. Uh, Anthony Clement studied uh, in his thesis and other groups like these has the property. Uh, that there are words in it that, in at least one in fact, that the space representation of G over A is equal to the space of representation of G modulo the normal closure of W for any algebraic group A. I meant by equal isomorphic. Okay? And of course, this is a consequence of the fact that G is not half here. And that's not residually finite. So it can't be the limit. Remember that Machet in 1940 showed that all finitely generated linear groups are residually finite. All right? So, so how might a person use the previous corollary to compute invariance of G? Okay, so let's actually get involved here. Let's actually get our hands dirty. And I'm going to cite one of your theorems soon. Okay, so let's look at this, look, let, let's look at this wonderful, let's look at this wonderful group here. And I say wonderful for very special reasons. And uh, which I might not get to discuss. And uh, so here we have a group on three generators, okay, subject to this relation. And we have that P that's not equal to Q are R primes. And we're going to define the commutator as being A inverse B inverse, I'm sorry, A inverse B inverse AB. You can also define it as AB times A inverse B inverse. If you do that, something strange will happen. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I'm actually defining it in this fashion, okay? So here we have this wonderful group, and we know that it's not free, okay? Why is it not free? Well, we know. <laughs> I could say something wild, like, well, it's of cohomological dimension too, but I don't want to deal with that. Uh, so anyway, it follows that the dimension of this, of this group is actually going to be three times the dimension of PSL2 complex minus one, from what I said earlier. Because that's, the word W is not, okay? The word W is not, uh, it's not trivial, okay, and, th and this is the consequence. Using a fiber lemma attributed to Claude de Chevalet, we can show that the dimension of the space representation of G of a PSL2 complex is actually greater or equal to the deficiency of G times the dimension of PSL2 complex, which we know is three, and we know that too well, right? What so, is, what is the... Uh, uh, the deficiency. I have to tell you what the deficiency is. The deficiency of a presentation is the number okay, of generators minus the number of relations. So we have here three generators, right? And we have one relation. So the deficiency of this group is going to be two. Okay, so let's see what happens. So consolidating all this stuff, we have that six is smaller is small equal to the dimension of uh, the space representation of G over the health complex and it's smaller equal to A. Okay, so that doesn't look very impressive. It's good, but it's not that very impressive. Okay, so we can do better than that, and we are going to do so. <laughs> we propose to find a seven-dimensional summarity by computing the dimension of a proper portion of G. And this is where the beginning of, of you know, the calculus involving you know, space representation arises. It is really the beginning. So let n in G be the normal closure of the element generated by B to the P. Okay? Then G modulo n minus, I'm sorry, minus the number, modulo normal closure of uh, B to the P is isomorphic to this. You can see that. You, you know, people can sit down and get to that. So now we have here, if you observe, this is a, the free product of a, uh, of a infinite cyclic group and two, uh, and, and, two uh, and two finite cyclic groups. So right away, we know that the dimension of the space of representation of G modulo n over A, where A is PS2 complex, is going to be equal to the dimension of this thing. Because I said before that the product, 
okay, the free product of group, when you look at the dimension, breaks up into the product of the, of the corresponding okay, algebraic varieties. So the dimension of that is seven. Why is that? Well, the special representation of a free group of rank one, the free abelian group, is going to have dimension three, as I said earlier. Z mod P, we actually did those calculations, remember that? Mm -hmm. You did them. I remember. Those go, that is going to be two-dimensional, and over here we have a two-dimensional variety. Now the product of all these things, the dimensions add in the product, so that is going to become seven. So right away we have here an example, okay, that this, this will actually assist us in our, in our work. Now, that still doesn't say much. I need to actually show that the dimensional space of representation of G is actually greater or equal to 7. I have to, I have to get to that. So how am I going to do that? Ah, well, we will need to use the there's following a, theorem of Magiwix. There's there. an S in your name? Yeah, you stole my <laughs> name. Sorry. That's all right. It's a different guy. Huh? I am sorry. <laughs> OK, there's a C there, I forget. Yes. And the following theorem is what we are going to use. This is from our last paper of 2008. Okay? So this is the theorem. Now, I could actually go through this theorem with you. It is a method of computing dimension of certain cyclically paint stronger in the groups. I am not going to go through it, but I want to bring to your attention this particular inequality here. I said that the dimension of a cyclically paint stronger in the group of this type has to be uh, smaller equal to 3n plus 1, where n is the number of generators of, of x. Okay, so in our case it has 2. So right away we know then that the dimension of this group, the special representation of this group, actually has to be equal to 7. Okay, so we know that right away. Okay, and that came out of this, out of this thing here. Okay, now something else I wanted to tell you is that, you know, Majovix and, and myself uh, show that the spaces of representations of these groups actually have to be reducible. So right away you obtain another invariant of the group uh, that we began with, G, and that is that it is reducible. You could actually count it. We actually delivered a formula to the mathematical community through the internet that they can use to count you know, that if they actually want. Okay? So, so there it is. Now, you know, I really should not be mentioning uh, para-free groups. I finished with them a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> but I feel that it's necessary to drag them into this forum, primarily because, you know, they were invented by Gilbert Bumslag. And these groups, okay, are so much like free groups that, you know, if you want to kill an invariant, well, why don't you drag your invariant to the class of para-free groups and see it die? Right? Well, the problem is that this invariant does not die. <laughs> okay, so let's actually go and look at this. Okay, so paraphrase groups were reconstructed by Gilbert Bumslag. Some claim in that hope of finding a counterexample to the conjecture asserting that a group of cohomological dimension one is free, but this is false. Actually, this is on the internet somewhere, in many places, in fact. A more likely reason was a question raised by Hannah Neumann after seeing a result of, of Wilhelm Magnus that we shall discuss in due time. And Gilbert, you know, Gilbert told, you know, told me this. We said that our finally generated group G is power free of rank N provided one and two holes. And what is one and two? That is procedurally neopotent, okay? That means that um, given, given any non-trivial element in the group, there exists a homomorphism of the group into the important group that does not kill that element, okay? Does not send it to the identity. And the other thing is that it has the same lower central sequence as a free group of rank n. That is, that this thing here is isomorphic to the lower central sequence of a free group of rank n. Now, this, this is where Hannah Neumann comes in. Wilhelm Magnus, in, you know, in his work in the 1930s, showed that, okay, if a group G is uh, n generated and shares this property with a free group of rank n, then the group G has to be free. So Heine Neumann, when she saw that result, she said, my God, could any group that is not free have that property? So, you know, Gilbert Bonslag 
heard this, and he went to work. Because there was that conjecture running around at the time that, you know, a group of homological dimension um, one was necessarily free. So he went to work on that, but that was the motivating reason for it, okay? And, uh, and as you notice, if you notice here, this is an infinite number of invariants. An infinite number of invariants for a non-free, you know, well, a non-cyclic free group, or, you know, Okay, sorry here, this is what I mean. Okay, so now let's define the deficiency because this is important for us. The matrices work only important the property two. It, well, matrices. Yeah, oh my God, he proved so, so many. Yeah, 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 they were really important. important. But he was really only talking about the property two. Yes, he, he yes, he proved that. Yeah, that that. The, 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 yes, yes, but you know that was the motivating factor, the launching reason for, okay, the invention of the class of paraphrase groups, which is a very fabulous class of groups. We don't even know if they're hyperbolic. We don't even know if they're linear. We don't know a lot of things about them. This whole important question is going to have to be answered at some point. So now let me define what the, uh, the, uh, the deviation of a paraphrase group is. The deviation of a paraphrase group, G, is M minus R where n is the minimum number of generators necessary to generate the group, and r is the rank of the free group that it shares the lower central sequence with. Okay? So there we are. Okay, so, and let me just say this because I want to, to, to drag you to other great geometry as soon as possible. A direct result of Magnus investigations is that a paraphrase group of rank n is free if and only if it has deviation zero. Okay? Now recall that an n generated group G is free if and only if the dimension of the group G is equal to 3n. So it follows that if G is an n generated pair free group, then the deviation of G is zero if and only if the dimension of the spatial representation of G is equal to 3n. So we have dragged this thing into, you know, into an, an invariant of algebraic varieties. Okay, in other words, up to isomorphism, a finitely generated paraphrase group of uh, group G of deviation zero is determined by an invariant of an algebraic variety, namely the spatial representation of G over A. And it's this dimension. Okay? So let me actually cite some properties of paraphrase groups that you can actually be convinced that they are extremely close to free groups. Okay, so they're very similar to free groups because of this. They agree with a free group on an infinite number of invariants. Infinite. Okay? Um, so they are, for example, residually finite, Hopfian, torsion free. Okay? Even uh, uh, in 1975, Urstambach and Gilbert von Slack show examples of non free pair free groups, all of whose, of all of whose countable subgroups are free. Now, for those people that are new to, you know, to group theory or something, I don't know, remember that uh, subgroups of free groups are free, you know. So, so now we're going to drag an invariant into this class of groups. And uh, the invariant that we're going to, to drag in is the function n sub d of r sub a of g. And now we're going to work in a sub too complex because we know by Sanov in the 1930s he showed that every free group embedded into a sub too complex. <coughs> so because we're studying a class of groups that is so close, okay, to free groups, we're going to compute this invariance in a group where all free groups embed. Okay? So we're working there. So what is this invariant n sub d of r sub a of g? This invariant says, suppose that you're an algebraic variety. N sub, D, N, sub, N sub D says to you, hello, how many irreducible components of dimension D do you have? Suppose that your dimension is 5 and D is 7. You're going to say, I have no irreducible components of dimension 7. So this is an invariant. This is a question that is being asked of algebraic varieties. Okay? So here we are. So we're dragging this invariant into the, the arena of group theory, finally generated group theory. Okay, and um, so let me compute the invariant for the spatial representation of a free group. Well, 